name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am here in the Research and Development Center looking to spend some of that science that I earned in the last episode. You haven't seen me here really all that much of late uh, because I've been deliberately putting my energies toward earning funds rather than earning science. Uh, the reason being is because, well, I got five nodes left on this tier seven and then uh, I cannot research anymore. I didn't want to end up, you know, capping out before the research and development center was done. And the research and development center is being upgraded. It's in the process right now. It's still going to take, oh, what is that? Just under seven days uh, for the research and development center to be finished. And then I'll have all of the various nodes unlocked and start working my way up the tech tree. Anyway, while I'm pecking around trying to decide which of these to pick up, why don't we talk about what's coming up in this episode. Uh, two episodes ago, you saw me launch, or not launch, but start the Korion 1 and the Korion 2 both on their way, uh, Korion 1 to the moon and the Korion 2 to Minmus. Last episode focused on the adventures of the Korion 1 around the moon. This episode, we're going to be getting to the Korion 2. Now, you might recall that both of those two vessels had to rendezvous with objects that were in polar orbits around their respective bodies. And I spent some time a couple of episodes ago talking about how to accomplish that. With the Korion 1, I was able to time my injection into the moon's orbit so that my inclination with this polar orbit was very, very small, making the rendezvous fairly easy. However, with the Korion 2, the window in order to make that burn and get the rendezvous right into the right inclination would have been too long and I wasn't going to wait, so I just fired off the Korion 2 anyway. And it's going to have to make about a 60 degree inclination change when it gets to Minmus. And I'm going to talk about how do we do that and accomplish the rendezvous in a relatively efficient and timely manner. We also have the launch of a new vehicle coming up, uh, the RMD, which is going to be an, another asteroid chaser. Uh, you saw the RMB several episodes ago, Rendezvous, Intercept, and Capture, a B-class asteroid, RMD, much the same deal, except it's going to be with a much larger D-class asteroid. Uh, so that will be coming up a little later in this episode, but right now... Uh, let's see, I'm just about closing in on my decision, and I decided to go with heavy aerodynamics. Yeah, heavy aerodynamics, uh, bigger space shuttle sometime in the future. That's really what that's going to be all about. But that is going to take some time to research. Let's see here. Yeah, a little less than five days. So uh, we'll have to be getting to that uh, later on in a future episode. Right now, though, I do have to make a quick stop with the Korion 1. You may recall from last episode that uh, one of the contracts that the Korion 1 was supposed to pick up was this temperature scan. To do a temperature scan above a certain waypoint uh, and below a certain altitude. And uh, to my surprise, after capturing one temperature scan, the contract spawned a second waypoint. Um, and because the Korion's in this polar orbit and only can get to waypoints as the moon rotates underneath as the waypoint rotates underneath the Korion's orbit, uh, we had to wait like two days for that waypoint to come up. But it is coming up right about now. There we go. Oh, and of course, <laughs> I guess that should have been expected. Doing that temperature scan spawned a third waypoint. And once again, that third waypoint is to the east of us. We're going to have to wait for the moon which is rotating in the opposite direction, of course. Oh, wow, it's going to take more than two days. Oh, well, we'll have to come back to this a little bit later and pick up that third one. <laughs> anyway, about a day later, I got this interesting contract here coming up to rescue Wilman from orbit and his debris from orbit about the moon. Now, I, I can't give up free Kerbals. I will always do that. So I scooped that up pretty oh, quick. But man. when I took a look at his orbit, he's in this fairly large, rather inclined orbit around the moon. And of course, the Korion 1 is currently in orbit around the moon as well. It'd be cool if I could pick him up on the way out of here. Now, you can see the orbits are very, very different. 
And Kerbal Engineer is telling me that the Karayan currently has 585 meters per second in it. But that's with six tons of Kegel 2 attached to it, which I'm going to be leaving in polar orbit. Do I have enough delta V to make that orbital change and get back to Kerbin? Or the Kerbin station, really? I don't know. It'll be interesting to find out, but uh, that's going to have to be for a future episode. We have to get that temperature scan out of the way first. Right now, MAPSAT-4 is just about getting ready for its orbital insertion about Minmus. I launched this four episodes ago without a whole lot of fanfare because I had a lot of other things going on at the time, but this mission is long overdue. Unfortunately, no contracts associated with it, but uh, I just wanted to get going with, with doing some more mapping. Um, it's been a long time. My old mapping satellites are way, way old tech. So this has got some, some new stuff on it. It's got the multi-spectral analyzer from uh, ScanSat that will begin to scan biomes. So we'll get a biome map of Minmus, and I do plan on sending one out to the moon as well. Heck, I might as well put one around Kerbin while I'm at it. But uh, the main thing I want to look at is this M700 survey scanner. Let's deploy the scanner. This is a stock thing for surveying for resources. I do want to get into resource extraction. So let's see here. Perform orbital survey. Yep, oh, transmitting. Upload 100%. Ooh, no message after that. Okay, I'm not sure what just happened there. I was thrown by this for quite some time. At first, I thought it had something to do with ScanSat, some sort of ScanSat integration. So I spent a lot of time playing with the ScanSat map and the settings and stuff like that. Um, turned out ScanSat's not the issue. The issue is actually with Remote Tech. I didn't discover this for a bit of time. Remote Tech was interfering with the transmission. Thankfully, there is a patch available on the Remote Tech forum. So we're going to try this again. Perform orbital survey and they're going up to oh and this time oh this time I got a message that it's complete 25 science too and you can see now I have this overlay on top of Minmus yo it's insto scan <laughs> no need to go around the planet this is done so let's take a look at this we'll focus on the planet open this up oh a nice little pie chart that's nice oh yellow is the biggest one and yellow is dirt. <laughs> Not quite sure what I can do with dirt. I have a lot of other resources here as well, and I don't know what is stock and what is coming in because of mods. I see carbonite there. I don't have carbonite installed, so I'm not sure if that means anything. And some of this, I suspect, has to do with the interstellar mod. Uh, but boy, lots of resources here. You know, what I'm really interested in, what I'd love, I mean, one is liquid fuel and oxidizer and monoprop. That'd be great. But the other is ore. This is ore. I know that's the stock. Ore can be mined into resources like fuel. That'd be great. But what I'd really love to get is hydrogen. This is hydrates. Hydrates mean hydrogen, right? I would love to be able to manufacture hydrogen. I also noticed if I scroll down, I noticed this a little bit later, that I do have water too. Water obviously can be turned into hydrogen. Um, because if I can get liquid hydrogen out of the deal, um, that can I can start getting into uh, better propellants for my fusion drives. But uh, you know what? All of this is going to have to wait. I'm going to have to play with this and uh, figure some stuff out. Obviously, lots of things to figure out for future episodes, but right now, uh, the Karayan 1 requires our attention again. Yeah, it's now coming up to its third temperature scan. Should be any moment now. And, oh, for God's sakes. As you can see, there's a fourth one there now. And I bet you it's to the east of us again, because that seems to be the pattern. Let's take a look. Yep, there it is. <laughs> Oh my God, these guys are never going to get home. Uh, we have now gone uh, well over halfway around the planet in the wrong direction. I don't mind doing all of these scans. They're actually really easy. It would be just nice to have seen them all ahead of time so I could plan this. I would have done them completely in the opposite order. So again, that's going to take well over about maybe two and a half more days to get to that one. 
Hopefully it'll be the last one, but who knows. But that's not going to be happening in this episode. We're going to have to come back to these guys next episode. Right now, as promised, we're getting to the Karayan 2 and its Minmus insertion. I'm sure you just noticed that engine being on. That's actually just the animation for the engine. It actually isn't on. It's not producing any thrust or using any fuel. It's some sort of weird glitch with Interstellar. I don't quite get what's going on here. Let's turn them back on again. Okay, the animation, the engine animation is not coming back. Yeah, that's just an animation issue. Uh, it functions just fine. It's just when I come out to the Karayan 2, uh, those engines are, the animation for them is on. I don't know why. Anyway, let's take a look at what we got. So we'll, we'll focus on uh, Minmus here. You can see we're coming up over the North Pole. And I want to rendezvous with the Karayan station, which is in that lower polar orbit there uh, that I've lined up with. I need to make maybe about, I don't know, a 50 or 60 degree inclination change. But what I want to do right now is actually just simply affect my trajectory just a little bit. I want to push my periapsis up to 50 kilometers because that's the altitude that the space station is in. And... Uh, I also want to adjust my inclination so it's as close to 90 degrees as I can get it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to burn halfway between uh, anti-normal to adjust my inclination and radially outwards to push up my periapsis. Okay, that's working. Let's do this. So my, I'm watching my inclination and my periapsis. My periapsis is going up and my inclination is going down. So my inclination is getting close to 90 degrees already, so I'm going to move a little bit more to the radially out, so I affect my periapsis more than my inclination. Right around there, I think. It's working. Whoop! There we go, okay. Yeah, periapsis just over 50 kilometers, inclination just over 90 degrees. I think that ought to do it. So. Let's explain here what we're going to do. I'm going to set up a node. I'm going to actually not use the node once I get there, but just to sort of explain what we're doing. I'm adding a node right here at periapsis. And all I want to do is just get my capture. I'm not trying to get a rendezvous at this point. I'm not trying to, uh, to affect my inclination and match inclinations with my target at this point. I simply want to get a capture and keep my apoapsis fairly high. The higher my apoapsis, the higher, I don't know if it's going to be the ascending or the descending node down there, but one of those is also going to be down there. The higher that node is going to be and the cheaper my inclination is going to be because I'll be moving slower. Um, however, I only have a limited amount of patience, so I don't want to wait too long in order to make my inclination change. Just four hours and 40 minutes. Let's see what that's like. So I'm going to put another maneuver node down there and I'm just going to again this is another one I won't use but just to explain what I'm gonna do I'm gonna use this one to affect my inclination so we're gonna go anti-normal let's use precise node there we go anti-normal and you can see how much just a very small burn affects my inclination down there and I don't even know if I'm on the ascending or descending node there. But you can see that it's going to not take too much to change my inclination because at that point, I'll be going very, very slowly uh, or relatively slowly compared to my closest approach to Minmus. Anyway, hopefully you got the idea what the plan is, but our closest approach to Minmus isn't gonna be for another two and a half hours. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But the RMD is sitting on the pad. Uh, I think it's time to get it on its way. This is an asteroid redirect mission, and you've seen me do this mission type before, because back in episode 60, I launched the RMD with the mission to rendezvous with, redirect, and capture a B-class asteroid and get it in around the moon. And in fact, that contract still isn't completed because the RMB is still on its way to the moon. Uh, yeah, it's, it's still going there. It took a long path to get there. So that should happen in a future episode. This particular mission is to do the same thing with a D-class asteroid, a much, much bigger beastie, 
and uh, get it around Minmus this time. So very much the same mission type, very much the same design in the vehicle, except everything has been scaled up. Everything is bigger. Is basically it's basically the exact same idea, just bigger and better, as you can see. And just as before, what I'm doing is. Uh, I waited until the Kerbal Space Center was underneath the predicted trajectory of the asteroid coming through the Kerbin system, and then I'm launching into an inclination to match that trajectory. In this case, uh, and again, I just eyeball that part of it, I'm launching into a 50 degree inclination. And that should uh, make my rendezvous quite a bit easier because I'm launching into the inclination that uh, matches the plane the incoming asteroid. There we go, our first set of liquid fuel boosters have just fallen away. And in fact, why don't we use this as an opportunity to check just to see how we are doing. Okay, you can see the asteroid trajectory in blue. There's us in red. Ooh, I wish I launched a few degrees higher for my inclination, but oh well, this is what we got now. I'm just performing my circularization here and I'm just doing it from map view so I can watch my my orbit form and what I'm doing as you can see is I'm pulling my inclination further to the north and you can see that uh, yeah I you know a little bit of manipulating up here in space and I can get this to be pretty close to matching the inclination of the incoming asteroid there that that, that ought to do it and as we finish off our circularization, I will say that I did learn a few things from the RMB. You might recall that the RMB had some, well, electrical issues when its one and only battery bank uh, shorted out. And I had to rely on the batteries that were built into the probe body through the whole thing, pretty much. Uh, now, backup batteries. Hey, how's that for a thought? So <laughs> that problem shouldn't re-arise. As well as backup solar generation. I really have to start thinking more about building redundancy into my systems. Anyway, with that done, it's time to plot our rendezvous burn. As before, we'll set up a maneuver that will take us out on a trajectory that roughly matches the incoming trajectory of the asteroid. The cost of this is about the same as the cost of leaving the Kerbin system, just a little bit more. And we'll use the Remote Tech Flight Computer to execute the node for us. And as it executes, we'll look at it from out here. All right, here we can get a better view of what's going on. Let's zoom in on Kerbin. You can see our orbit rising following the trajectory of the incoming asteroid. You can also see over there on precise node that this is costing me 300, 957 meters per second, which again is just, a, just past what it takes to exit the Kerbin sphere of influence. All right, we are coming to the end of it now. All right, let's close that off, take a look. And our closest approach is, what's that, uh, just under 23,000 kilometers, which I know feels like a big separation, but from this distance, no, that's, that's going to be fine for now. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll revisit this particular vehicle after it exits the Kerbin Sphere of Influence, and we'll start to fine-tune our approach. But right now, I really do need to get back to the Kurion. The Kurion is a little over a minute away from Periapsis, where we're going to do our capture burn. What's sort of funny, that waypoint there? That's Kerbin Station. That's our eventual destination, just about 20 kilometers away. I had no idea it was going to come that close to it. It almost feels like I could have worked this out and uh, done a rendezvous right here, but uh, I wish I switched to target mode because then I'd know what my relative velocity was to Kerbin Station, but I suspect it's pretty large. We have a 55 degree inclination difference. In addition, we are on a flyby trajectory while Minmus Station is in an orbit. So uh, trying to do the rendezvous here would have been probably a bad idea. Don't worry, ladies. We'll get you over to Kerbin Station soon enough. Let's see here. You can see I didn't delete the node after all, but I'm going to largely ignore it. I'm just using it actually for timing. Uh, according to Kerbal Engineer there, my 
burn time should be about 32 seconds. So I'm going to start this at about 20 seconds. And I'm not going to follow the node. I'm just going to keep it locked on the retrograde vector. So let's see here. Yeah, let's hit it. Now, you're probably noticing something. I am at full thrust, and you see no engine effects. That is really annoying. That's part of this anima engine animation issue I'm having with uh, Herbal Interstellar. I mean, the sound is there, as you can tell. And I'm burning. You can see the node going down and my velocity changing. Uh, but <laughs> no engine effects which is really, really unfortunate. I, I really do want to try and straighten this out. Anyway, I just burned until my time to apoapsis was about two and a half hours. I figured that wasn't too long to wait. And then it was time to set up our plane change maneuver. So you can see down here I got the descending node, so that's where I'm going to be putting my maneuver node. And uh, setting up this plane change, which ended up costing me just 43 meters per second to make that about 55 degree plane change. Not too bad. So now it's just a matter of time warping down to there, performing that burn, which unfortunately was once again a here but not C type scenario when it comes to the engine effects. But with that burn completed, it was finally time to set up our rendezvous. And you've seen me do this style of rendezvous before. The idea is to burn down retrograde, getting my orbit down so that its period is such that I complete one orbit and then rendezvous with the station. The key to all this being, once again, to remember that if you are making burns that are perpendicular to the path, so that's either radial or normal, you want to do them when you're moving slowly and that's far away from your parent body. But if you're making burns that are in a prograde or retrograde direction, you want to do them when you're closest to the parent body. And doing all that, uh, you will be doing things relatively efficiently. Now that doesn't come without a cost. Now that we're closing into the station, I'll be pointing out that this is about a day later than when we first made that 20 kilometer pass of the station just before we did our capture burn. But that's all right. It, uh, these guys don't have much, wait, whoa. Okay, am I crazy or is the station rotating? The station is definitely spinning about. Oh, what fun. Okay, well, let's get ourselves a little bit closer here and sort of assess the situation. Okay, I just want to bring my relative velocity to a stop, but it certainly looks like the station is no longer moving right now. Okay, there we go. That's close enough to stop relative to the station, but uh, I don't want to get in there and have it flip about when I'm in the middle of docking. So I'll, what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll EVA out, yeah, I'm going to EV, EVA out the FIA. We'll get the FIA over there. I, I, I sometimes find, and I think it does have to do with remote tech, that um, remote tech and the stock guidance systems sometimes get into a bit of a fight. But if you put a Kerbal in there, it seems to straighten, straighten it out. Remote tech, you know, uh, succumbs to the Kerbal's influence, I suppose. Once once you have a Kerbal in there, remote tech goes, okay, I'm no longer in control, there's a Kerbal in control, and everything seems fine. And you know, while we're coming over here, why don't we take a look at the station? Um, I really didn't spend much time talking about it before, but uh, I think it's worthwhile to sort of take a look at it, put some lights on. Lufia's got her helmet lights on, so we should be able to see this as we get in close. Yeah, when I launched this, I just I didn't spend much time talking about it, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's a simple station. It's all in one go. Lots of docking ports at the one end. Got a habitat module in the middle to house five kerbals, a copal at the top. I really do like the whole antenna array up there towards the top end. Okay, that's enough admiring. Let's take that. Let's get Glyphia into the copula module. She'll hold this thing steady while the Corian comes in and uh, performs the docking. I was about to say uh, back before I noticed that the station was uh, spinning that uh, these guys are actually going to have to 
cool their heels for just a little bit. Uh, the mission, the whole reason I have them out here is because I do have a Kerbal on Minmus's surface uh, that needs some rescuing along with her command pod or cockpit or something. I, I, I think it's a Mark II cockpit that's down there with her. But anyway, um, I need to get her and the cockpit back to Kerbin's surface safely. And for that, I require a purpose-built lander, which has yet to make its way out here. <laughs> but that is, actually, I think it's all built. It's just waiting for the launch pad to be reconditioned after that arm B launch. So you'll be seeing that lander for sure uh, next episode. And uh, once we get it out here towards Minmus, we'll... Uh, We'll perform that particular mission and see if we can get uh, that Kerbal and her cockpit uh, off of Minmus's surface. But anyway, we are just about there. Oh wow, we're under a meter. And half a meter. Come on, where are we here? Point and... are we docked? Come on, One more push. There we go, we are docked. Actually, the one thing I kind of want to think about, there is a uh, transfer stage still at the bottom of the station, kind of an ugly thing down there. I wouldn't mind seeing if we can get rid of that. Here, Ukraine can take the liquid fuel that's in it. We might as well put that to use, but I can't use that excess oxidizer. Remember that the Korean 2, being nuclear powered, actually does not require any oxidizer uh, do I want to keep that oxidizer? I don't know. I don't think so. I actually have quite a surplus of oxidizer in space now because, you know, I keep bringing up liquid fuel and oxidizer, but I'm using more liquid fuel thanks to the Cryon 2 than I am using oxidizer. Yeah, I think I'll get rid of that. Why don't we get Glafia? She'll use a little bit of our handy dandy explosives and we'll deal with this particular debris. Err, go Glafia, push, push, push. This thing is not light, and it's awkward, and it's spinning. Okay, let's see how far we are from the station. There's the station back there. Oh, about 85 meters. Regulations dictate that all explosions must be at least 100 meters away. I don't know, I just made that up. <laughs> it's crazy, even 100 meters is ridiculous. But, uh... You know, explosions in space, yeah, the, the debris just goes and goes and goes. There's not much danger as far as shock waves go, despite the way the camera shakes when you do these explosions. But uh, flying debris everywhere, that's what the danger is for sure. But uh, let's see here. Oh, we just passed 100 meters from the station, according to Kerbal Engineer. So let's get in there, get rid of this thing. I already got the explosives attached, so we will right-click on it. Come on. Always fun when things are spinning. There we go. And activate. And back up very, very quickly. As always, I always keep lots of explosives around because they are fun. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there we are. Debris gone. Station looks beautiful up there in the distance. But uh, I think I'm going to be ending it for this particular episode. So thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.